So hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I am your interim host, Carl Smallwood, that is Carl with a K, Smallwood with a small, followed by the wood. Yep, it's the real, real name. I'm going to say it every time because people still don't believe me. And today we're talking about Sergeant Stubby, the most decorated dog of World War I. And as with all the videos here on Biographics, this one is based on a script submitted to us by a member of our writing team. That member today being Arnaldo Teodrani. And before we continue, I'd like to point out that I'm really, really not well. I've been bedridden for the last few days. So if anyone out there thinks I look paler or more sickly than usual, that's why. Fortunately, me being British, I'm going to guess that that's not too big an issue because I always look like this anyway. So let's continue. From 1914 to 1918, tens of millions of young men suffered the horrors of the Great War, the trenches, the maddening din of artillery, the hail of machine guns and the deadly fog released by gas attacks. Almost 10 million of them never returned home. But even when trudging through the mud, the mist, the misery, millions of men could count on an army of brave and loyal companions, some 16 million animals who served on both sides of the conflict. Horses, pigeons and dogs were conscripted to transport supplies, serve as messengers, stand guard and even provide first aid. Dogs proved to be rather versatile in this regard. They hauled weapons and supplies, carried messages, killed vermin in the trenches, detected enemy scouts and stood guard. As many as 10,000 canine friends were trained to find wounded soldiers in no man's land. They became known as mercy dogs, clad in a red cross vest. They carried a first aid kit, water and, of course, hard liquor to comfort the wounded troops. In today's biographics, we are proud to bring you the story of a small mongrel who could and did perform all of those duties. More astoundingly, our friend was not conscripted. In fact, one could argue that he volunteered. This is the story of Sergeant, in quotation marks, Stubby, the most decorated dog of World War I. <laughs> European nations have been swallowed by the maelstrom of the Great War on July 28, 1914. As of March 1917, most theatres of the conflict had ground to a stalemate, the continent scarred by trenches, shell holes and unburied bodies. On April 6, 1917, US President Woodrow Wilson declared war against the German Empire and an American expeditionary force was assembled and trained. Its soldiers, nicknamed Doughboys and referred to as such throughout the rest of this video, were to be transferred to France to join their British, Commonwealth and French allies on the Western Front against Germany. One of the Doughboys training camps was Camp Yale in New Haven, Connecticut. This was home to the 102nd Infantry Regiment, itself part of the 26th Division under Major General Clarence R. Edwards. As the troops drilled and prepared for war, one peculiar recruit appeared seemingly out of nowhere. A mongrel with friendly eyes and a determined snout wandered into the camp. His size was far from impressive. In fact, his legs were rather short and stubby. Hmm, I wonder if there's a connection here. But as they say, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Besides, this dog had made it pretty clear that Camp Yale was his home and the Doughboys were his new family. You may have even called him a volunteer who wanted to fulfill his duty for his country. Or, as the New York Times would put it, in such a time when men were parting from mothers and wives to defend the honour of Uncle Sam, was he, a mere wanderer without dependents, to think of self. The Camp Yale recruits happily adopted this new soldier and named him Stubby because of his stubby little legs. By October, the 102nd Regiment was urged to leave for France to complete training overseas, and somehow the Doughboys had managed to hide Stubby from their superiors. Unwilling to leave behind their unofficial mascot, they smuggled him aboard their transport ship, the SS Minnesota. <laughs> Stubby made it aboard, wrapped inside a folded trench coat carried by the human who will become his constant companion, 25-year-old private Robert Conroy. After landing in France, Conroy and Stubby boarded a train heading to New Chateau, Western France. When in transit, an officer inspecting the troops' carriages took Conroy by surprise. What was this private doing with a stowaway dog? As the enraged officer was about to mete out punishment, Stubby launched his counterattack. The mongrel stood upon his hind legs, raised his front right paw, and executed a perfect salute. The officer stood speechless and then abandoned all resistance. And I can only think of that scene in like Shrek 2 with like, you know, puss in boots of just the... I can't do it, obviously, because I'm British and pale, so you just look at me and think, God, just 
go back to bed, man. This this is not the one. But imagine a cute animal doing it and then doing a cool salute. Not only was Stubby allowed to stay with Conroy, but he was appointed the official mascot of the 102nd, so he wouldn't be bothered anymore. After reaching New Chateau, Conroy and Stubby were introduced to their regiment commander, Lieutenant Colonel John Machine Gun Parker, a hardened veteran of the Spanish-American War. Machine Gun fell victim to the Mongrel's charms. When Conroy was assigned to a reconnaissance unit, Parker allowed him to take along his buddy. So a dog would be quite useful when you're sniffing out Germans. In October 1917, the French had reconquered the town of Chemin de Dames, not far from the Belgian border. Their forces now exhausted, they badly needed some reinforcements. Thus, in January 1918, the training of the 26th was cut short, and its doughboys were assigned to that sector. They would complete their training directly in the trenches, alongside their more experienced French allies. Conroy and Stubby reached the front lines in February of that year. This was a relatively quiet stretch of the Western Front, at least in theory. In in March alone, the 102nd suffered 446 casualties from poison gas attacks alone. The first attack came on March 17th. Luckily, Private Conroy had planned ahead, fashioning a custom-made gas mask for Stubby. When the clouds of terror seeped into the trenches, Conroy ordered his pal to hide in his own bunker. Stubby quickly learned from the experience and developed a talent, shall we say, to detect the first whiffs of chlorine, phosgene, and mustard gases. When the Germans released their next gas attack against the 102nd, Stubby barked loudly, alerting his furless friends about the impending danger. As the men wore their masks, Stubby noticed an off-duty sergeant still sleeping in a dugout. The mongrel dashed towards the unaware NCO and nipped it at his hands, until he woke up and donned his mask. Sergeant Curtin later honoured Stubby with a short poem that I'll read for you now. Listen to me and I will tell of a dog who went all through hell. He always knew when to duck the shells and buried his nose at the first gas smells. Pretty good. Pretty good. Stubby was indeed proving his worth. Besides saving humans from deadly mustard gas, this heroic dog with the trenches of the huge invasive rats stood guard alongside the sentries and kept them company and comforted the wounded. When the first shelling barrage hit the 102nd's trenches, Stubby experienced moments of sheer terror. Like, dogs don't like fireworks. Now imagine those fireworks were giant explosive artillery shells exploding mere feet away. But he soon got used to the maddening screams and booms of artillery. Moreover, thanks to his superhuman canine hearing, our buddy was able to hear the whistling sound of incoming bombardments well in advance. Barking madly, he would alert the doughboys, allowing them extra seconds to seek cover, no doubt saving many lives. On March 21st, the Germans launched their spring offensive, an attempt to break through the Western Front. On April 20th, German trench raiders overran the position manned by the 102nd and headed towards the village of Seychpre. Conroy and Stubby were resisting in the rear, but were ordered to help retake the village. The 102nd successfully pushed the Germans back to their original position, and French artillery finished the job, forcing the raiders to withdraw. Conroy and Stubby resettled at their original position. The following morning was calm, and Stubby decided to take a walk in the now quiet no man's land. Suddenly, an enemy shell exploded, releasing a hail of shrapnel. From the trench, Conroy could hear Stubby's loud distress barks, and there's nothing worse than the sound of just a hurt dog. It's like, it's that once, I cannot stand that noise. I hate when they put it in movies and fiction. It sucks. It's like, oh, it's like when you step on your dog's toe and you just feel so, so bad. So I remember once where, um, uh, like my old dog, I, I'm going to be putting, I'm going to be asking the editors to put in so many pictures of my old dog if I can find them. But yeah, I remember like my stepdad, he came in wearing his work boots and he stepped on the dog's foot. He was, he felt so bad. He just drove out and he immediately came back with like a Big Mac for the dog and just gave the dog a Big Mac. Uh, and then from that day onwards, the dog was always just mysteriously waiting in front of the door whenever he came home. Mysteriously trying to get under his feet. I wonder why. Anyway. From the trenches, Conroy could hear Stubby's loud distress barks. The private crept out of the trench and hugged his friend, realising in horror that he'd been wounded in his breast and his left foreleg. The army surgeons did their best to save their mascot, and Stubby made a full recovery by June. In July, he and Conroy were back in action. As they advanced against the enemy lines, marching amidst tall sheaves of wheat, many doughboys were struck by machine gun and artillery fire, their wounded bodies disappearing into the fields of gold. Stubby, once again, proved his worth. Thanks to his keen sense of smell, this tiny medic was able to locate his wounded compatriots, carrying first aid kits and offering precious comfort and, of course, some hard liquor before rushing to retrieve human help. Again, saving many, many lives. The entire 26th Division continued their advance, reaching the town of Chateau Thierry on the Marne River by July 10th. The locals celebrated the arrival of the Americans and, of course, their adorable mascot.
mascot. However, celebrations were interrupted by Stubby's own loud barks. Conroy realised that his buddy was sounding the alarm for another barrage of gas shells, and the troops immediately wore their masks and corralled the population to safety. Stubby again saved a bunch of lives. In gratitude for saving them from almost certain death, the women of Chateau Thierry presented Stubby with his own uniform, which of course is adorable, a suede leather blanket embroidered with the flags of the Allies. Conroy would later pin the numerous medals that the heroic dog collected in his military career upon this blanket and uniform. And speaking of medals, in a matter of weeks, Stubby would earn his most prized decoration. <laughs> The boys of the 102nd were allowed some weeks of R&R &R before their next action. On September 26th, they were to assault the German-held town of Marshville, a faint manoeuvre intended to distract the enemy from the main Allied attack at the Mess Argonne Offensive. Both the Americans and the Germans put up one hell of a fight. Over a single day, Marshville changed hands over four times before the 102nd retreated. 449 of their men were killed, wounded or captured, or listed missing, but the regiment had fulfilled its mission of diverting the enemy's attention. At one point during that day of gruelling attacks and counter-attacks, Conroy, Stubby and other soldiers were patrolling the outskirts of Marshville. Stubby's heightened sense perceived something, something hidden, something hidden nearby, something hidden in the shrubs. Without hesitation, Stubby leapt into the bushes, snarling with menace. Now, the enemy hiding in the undergrowth was described by the New York Times as a German spy. The guy in question wore a regular uniform, so it would be more accurate to describe him as a scout spying on the Americans. Whatever the guy's job description, the poor git had no appetite for being torn apart by a ferocious dog. Sure, the dog was this big, but remember, it's not the size of a dog, it's the size of the fight in it. So Stubby gave chase and lunged forward hitting the scout at the cars with all of his weight. As the man fell flat on his stomach, Stubby pounced on him and bit at the seat of his trousers, pinning him down. Before the German had time to react, a squad of doughboys intervened, taking him prisoner. Conroy and his friends realised that their captive wore a distinctive medal, the Iron Cross, the German decoration for bravery on the battlefield. Well, he didn't for much longer because they took it off him and gave it to Stubby and pinned it upon his uniform. So at this point, why did they not just just take Stubby out into no man's land? Just point him towards Germany, take off his lead and just follow him all the way to Berlin and just watch him just like, you no know, tear the balls off Emperor Wilhelm. He probably could have done it. Anyway. Now, for anyone who remembers history class, the Great War would be over on November 11th, 1918. Of course, neither the Allies nor the Germans knew that, and continued to supply each other with misery throughout October and early November. In fact, the last three weeks of the war must have been truly miserable for Stubby and friends, as noted by historian of the 26th Division, and I quote, The men were exhausted after fighting for three weeks under continual rain, with scanty food and little to no shelter. They had been gassed and shelled heavily near constantly. In November alone, the 26th had suffered over 400 dead and wounded and almost 500 gassed. Luckily, our two pals Conroy and Stubby made it in one piece to Armistice Day. The men and dog of the 26th Division would return home in March 1919, but before that they enjoyed their fair share of victory parades in France. Stubby could be seen marching alongside Conroy, proudly covered in medals. By then, he'd become something of a celebrity and was known as Sergeant Stubby, although he never received an official promotion, though he probably should have because he called a German spy and stole his Iron Cross. Back home, Stubby entered the American Legion, an organization of war veterans, joining in their parades and conventions. On those occasions, he was introduced to three presidents, Wilson, Coolidge, and Harding, respectively, and was decorated by General Blackjack Pershing, Commander-in-Chief of the American Forces in Europe. But in September 1922, Stubby decided to broaden his doggy horizons beyond military life and enrolled in law school at Georgetown University, Washington, D.C. Well, Robert Conroy did, but Stubby tagged along, becoming the mascot of the football team. Now, according to the Connecticut Military Department, and I quote here once again, between the halves, he would nudge a football around the field, much to the delight of the crowd. This little trick is thought to be, by some, the origin of the halftime show. So yeah, if you happen to enjoy just watching Usher absolutely kill it at the most recent halftime show, you, you might have Sergeant Stubby to thank for that. Sadly, Stubby's journey on this earth was already beyond its own half time. On April 4th, 1926, the New York Times published the news nobody wanted to hear. Stubby of the American Expeditionary Force enters Valhalla. They said he went to Valhalla. He went to Valhalla. Oh man, imagine like dogs in Valhalla, let's go, that's super strong. That's a great visual. And has anyone ever read that cool story about that concept of 
I think it was a Reddit prompt where just the writing prompt is like, uh, to go to Valhalla, you have to die with a weapon in your hand. And it's like a story of a guy who wakes up in Valhalla with like a spatula in his hand. And the writing prompt is like, try to explain why. And I won't spoil it. I'd recommend if anyone can track it down. But I really liked, as long as you die fighting, you go to Valhalla. And that fight can be metaphorical or literal. Anyway, but I digress and move back to Sergeant Stubby now. By the time of his death, Stubby was the proud wearer of a Humane Education Society Hero Medal, two American Legion Medals, three Service Stripes, two Campaign Medals, one Purple Heart. Remember, he was injured. The Republic of France Great War Medal. And of course, an Iron Cross he stole from a German. Had he been a good boy? Well, no, no. It could be argued that he was the best boy. He had the medals to prove it. Like, how many dogs do you know stole an Iron Cross off a German? So I hope everybody found this video to be educational, entertaining, and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things, and if you are inclined to agree, you can let the author of this one, Arnoldo Teodrani, know by clicking on the social links provided below. You can also like the video, comment with feedback or suggestions, like, I want to know, like, go tell me a story about, you know, your dog. I love my dog. It's dead now, but I love it. I had two dogs when we were kids. It was one, the first one was called Cracker. He was like a little, little staffy, um, uh, run that um, the owners didn't want so we got him like he had like a little white spot on the back of his neck so he wasn't considered to be um uh, like show worthy so we got him and he was awesome like so he was just like this little ball like daft as a brush we used to call him because when you'd sweep up he'd just like try and nibble at the bottom of the brush and then our second dog was a uh, staffy cross called penny i almost said poppy though so that's my brother's dog name <laughs> i remember every day before i went to school me and penny would have a cup of tea I would have a cup of tea every morning with my dog. So I'd just like, get myself a cup of tea. And like do those last little dregs of the little things at the bottom, just like put it down for the dog. And then I'd come in for my lunch because the school was nearby and have another cup of tea with my dog. And I remember when I'd visit home, I'll try and get the picture. So hopefully the, uh, um, the editor can put this one in because it's my favorite photo of just ever. I don't think I'll ever take a photo I love as much as this one. And it is where I, it was my first year at university. So I'd not seen my dog in about six, seven months. And I came home. And my dog was so excited that when I hugged her and my mum took a photo of us, the photo is blurry, not because the like the the camera was bad, but because the dog was shaking with excitement so much that the photo just comes out blurry. And the photo is just me like, because I've not seen my dog in like seven months. So if that photo, I'll get that photo and I'll put it behind. Please put it in. I love that photo. Anyway. Thank you for watching. I've been Carl Smallwood. I've not been well, but talking about dogs has put me in a far, far better mood than I was when I woke up this morning. Cheers to everyone for watching, and I hope you have the day that you deserve. Pet every dog you see. They're all good boys and girls. Cheers.